All right. Looks like we are ready to roll. OK, good morning. Good morning, everyone. My name is Marcelo Bellinazzo, uh, as Sergio mentioned before. Um, I do have a funny accent coming from an Italian family living in Brazil and in the United States. So if for any reason you don't understand something that I say or have any questions, I'll be happy to, uh, to clarify or to connect uh, and answer before, after the session. Um, uh, I, uh, I'm part of the Azure engineering team at Microsoft in Seattle. And uh, I lead a team of cloud ops advocates. Um, very similar to developer advocates, but we focus on engaging with the IT ops communities, trying to understand, you know, trying to get the feedback and understand the requirements from IT operations and bring those requirements into Azure engineering to make Azure a better cloud platform for IT operations in particular, okay? And for DevOps scenarios as well. So if you wanna uh, connect with our team, if you wanna uh, uh, follow us or uh, uh, see our content, we use the hashtag AZOps. Uh, that's kind of the easiest way to connect with us, with, uh, with, with the whole team, okay? Today, I'm not gonna talk about my team. Today, we're gonna talk about this team. This is a picture of the LinkedIn SRE team, okay? It's a very talented group of engineers, uh, and they've uh, implemented SRE inside the company. Uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna take a quick look at what site reliability engineering SRE is to get on the same page with some of the principles, some of the practices, and then we're gonna look into their journey implementing site reliability engineering into, into LinkedIn, okay? Uh, I just wanna see a quick show of hands. How many of you uh, have heard uh, of SRE or how many of you feel that you are familiar with site reliability engineering? Okay, good, about 40, 50%. Uh, I've been asking this question for the last 12 months and every time we get uh, you know, more and more people, SRE is definitely becoming more popular in terms of uh, more companies knowing about reliability engineering. Uh, also a lot more questions as well. It's a very vibrant community, very active community, so it's great, great to see the interest and great to see the connection with the DevOps community as well. By the way, SRE and DevOps share a lot. They uh, are aligned really well in terms of principles and practices, okay? You should understand DevOps probably a more generic set of principles, uh, and SRE is a more peculiar, particular implementation of those principles and some of the practices as well, but they do align really well, and during the presentation, you're gonna see some of the connection points uh, and why it makes a ton of sense for your IT operations team to actually um, learn and implement SRE. Uh, while the dev team is actually working and uh, adopting uh, DevOps principles and practices uh, as well, okay? So there are many definitions of SRE. I think the most important thing to understand is that the idea of reliability engineering, it's not necessarily focused on uh, how, uh, kind of, the, you know, the, what's happening with your processor, with your hard drive, with your memory and things like that. Monitoring is a very important part of SRE. It's a important, very important part of reliability. But reliability engineering is about the customer experience that you provide. Uh, it's about w the promises that your company is making to your users, right? It goes beyond some of these very technical, small metrics, right? Very similar to what Ken mentioned before. Uh, DevOps has many benefits, but one of the key benefits if you do DevOps right is to get, it gets you closer to your customer. And you're gonna see based on our conversation and some of the learnings from the LinkedIn team, SRE also gets you closer to your customer, okay? Again, there are many definitions. The one that I like the most was given to me by David Blank Edelman. David is now part of our team, but he, he is a published author in the SRE uh, space. And he's also one of the founders of the SRE Con. So David defines SRE as an engineering discipline designed to remove failure out of a system and bring that system to the level of reliability that you desire. Okay, it's kind of a long definition but there are several key elements, okay? The first one, engineering discipline. Okay, we're gonna, we're gonna take a look at what it means to be an engineering discipline. Designed to remove failure, to automate failure away of a system and take that system to the level of reliability that you need, that you desire, okay? Note that I'm not saying 100% reliability or perfect reliability. 100% reliability is unrealistic and it's actually not productive as well. 
okay? When you have to focus your resources to achieve 100% reliability, or as close as possible to 100% reliability, you're actually spending a lot of those resources you know, towards one goal, when you actually could be spending part of those resources to achieve other important goals of your organization. For example, launching new features faster, innovating faster, solve, solving customer problems, business problems in a much faster way. Okay? If you ask Ben Trainer, uh, Ben Trainer is now a VP of engineering at Google. He was hired in 2003 to actually manage a team of production engineers. Right? 2003, Google was going through a hyper growth phase. Um, and, and again, the infrastructure, the, the company, the services were becoming uh, global and they, they were reaching a scale that was pretty much impossible to manage those systems just by adding system administrators, just by adding humans, right? So that's why Ben Trainer was hired. That was the problem that he was hired to solve, right? He is a software engineer and he used his background and his skill set to build a team that essentially allowed Google to scale IT operations, right? And that team set the principles and set the practices that essentially enable Google to be, to have the environment that they have and to accommodate the growth that they have over the years. And they were really, really generous with the community. At some point, they actually shared you know, their, the principles and practices, their knowledge through the SRE book, which I strongly recommend that you, uh, that you read if you want to learn more about SRE. And a few months ago, the team also published uh, a workbook with a little bit more practical advice for companies other than Google trying to implement some of those principles and practices inside their own environment, okay? But going back to the definition, Ben Trainer would say that SRE is what happens when you hire or when you ask a software developer to design an operations team, an operations organization, okay? Uh, we're gonna see a little bit more about that. Is Google the only company doing SRE? Clearly not. Uh, more companies are doing SRE. And again, very similar you know, to DevOps. Each company has its own journey, right? So if you're gonna really go into look and inspect the SRE implementation inside of each one of these companies and other companies as well, from different sizes, different industries, you're gonna find differences. You're gonna find unique attributes to their SRE implementation, okay? The principles should apply, right, generically, but the practices can be very different depending on what's going on inside of the organization, okay? Two really nice resources to understand how other companies or companies other than Google are adopting SRE, um, the uh, Seeking SRE book, published by David Blank Edelman that I mentioned before. There's also a really cool ebook uh, written by Jason Hand. Jason is now also part of our team, very uh, non-speaker uh, in the DevOps community. He organizes the, the, DevOps, the DevOps days in Boulder, Colorado. Uh, and when he was working for VictorOps, he documented their process and their journey, essentially, building an SRE team, okay? All right. So before we jump into the LinkedIn story, into the link, LinkedIn journey, I just want to go over a few building blocks, a few principles, a few concepts for us to be on the same page about what SRE is and what SRE is not, okay? Behind these principles is the notion that SRE, the SRE organization, is not your typical ops organization, okay? Don't rename ops, <laughs> call them SRE and think that you are done, okay? Does it sound familiar for people practicing DevOps and trying to embrace and adopt DevOps, DevOps principles and practices? The same goes with SRE. As we go through the LinkedIn story, we're gonna see how much, how hard it is uh, and how much do you need to have very solid principles and reasons to embark into this journey, okay? The first principle that I'd like to call out is very basic, SRE believes that operations is a software problem, okay? SRE hires developers. It doesn't have to be only developers in the organization, but SRE hires developers. The SRE organization can code, they can build tools, they can read code, they can communicate with developers, they're willing to share metrics with developers, right? There is a strong connection between the SRE team and the developer team that is, is built just because they speak the same language, okay? And they understand each other. SRE works to automate toil away. 
toil being defined as those manual uh, repetitive tasks, most of them devoid of value for the organization, right? Let's be clear, toil is part of the operations work, okay? Traditionally, toil makes up basically 100% of the ops work. In the SRE space, or for an SRE, SRE organization to work, toil cannot be 100%, okay? So SRE is maniacal about eliminating toil, automating everything that can be automated in the ops space, right? To remove those manual tasks. So that's where software development comes into play, right? SRE tries to implement permanent engineering solutions to solving, uh, to creating an infrastructure as a code and to solving operational challenges, okay? And also, there, are, there is some guidance and best practices, including from Google and other companies, that essentially tells that SRE should limit the percentage of time that an engineer spends on toil. At Google in particular, which by the way seems to be a common best practice across companies that embrace SRE, the limit is 50%, the cap is 50%, which means 50% is the maximum amount of time, percentage of an engineer's time that can be dedicated to toil. The, the other 50%, or hopefully more than that, should be dedicated to engineering work, to projects that help increase the reliability of the environment, okay? Better documentation, better understanding, better systems architecture, architectural reviews, code, tools, essentially things that are going to eliminate the root cause of problems and help bring that infrastructure or that system or that stack to a more reliable state over the long term, okay? This one is gonna sound very familiar to DevOps practitioners, right? SRE basically is, is a data-driven discipline and embraces risk. Uh, we're gonna hear more tomorrow uh, about the state of the SRE report, but we know these numbers, right? Safer or faster, in the case of deployments, is safer, okay? SRE embraces risk. SRE helps the developer organization moves fast, or actually the company moves fast, okay? SRE requires monitoring and alerting, okay? Building a solid monitoring foundation is a requirement for SRE to work, okay? And using that data as the main decision, uh, main, main factor for decision making across not only the infrastructure space, but the app space as well, or the application life cycle is essential, right? Because the rest of the organization has to trust that data as well to make sure that the gates implemented are actually out, not only automated, they are automatic and they are data driven. They're not human gates, okay? There's a very strong cultural element as well that's driven by data and by learning your environment and knowing your environment really well, which is the discipline to do incident reviews for every incident in your infrastructure and review those incidents with key stakeholders, primarily your dev stakeholders, your dev, your partner dev organizations, and also your product, product owners, right? In a way that focus on the problem, attack the problem, not the people. Right, so blameless post-mortems are, are an essential part of SRE as well. And the last principle I'd like to call out before we go into the LinkedIn story is actually a centerpiece of SRE, right? SRE uses two concepts, the service level objectives and error budgets as a contract, as a way to establish a connection and shared accountabilities with the dev organization and with product owners as well. Let me explain those two concepts real quick, okay? Service level objectives are nothing more than just a reliability goal for a service, okay? And as I mentioned before, we're not talking about the percentage of CPU, CPU that your application uses or something like that. We're talking about user-centric metrics, user-centric indicators. The reliability goals for a service should care about those few indicators that really make or break the experience for your customer. Clearly, those are not, this is not, this is not a goal that SRE sets by itself. Here comes the hard part of this, right? The reliability goal for a particular service has to be set in agreement with the dev teams and with product owners. Right? The product owners play a big role. They are really having, most companies, they have a really 
I would say, rounded understanding of the customer experience, especially what the customer intended customer experience should be, they play a big role in defining the reliability goals. Okay, but this is the contract that holds these three organizations together and really allows SRE, again, to connect really well with DevOps and to contribute to the success of the organization, right? Because this is essentially focused on the customer, focused on the business, not focused on exactly small indicators about what's happening in the infrastructure. Don't get me wrong, those have to be measured, those have to be tracked. There are things that we're gonna do with them, but when we talk about the reliability go for a service, we're talking about those key, very important elements that define the customer experience, okay? Again, I mentioned before, very few systems need to have 100% reliability. I hope the airplanes and pacemakers continue to have that reliability, right? But I almost guarantee that most systems that we build, most systems that we manage, don't, ha don't need to have that level of reliability, okay? So let's just use 80% as an example. If we're building a service and we define that our service needs to be uh, maybe up or needs to be reliable 80% of the time, okay? What do we do with the, the rest of the time, right? The difference between the perfect reliability and your reliability goal for your service is the error budget. The error budget is exactly that, is a budget, and you spend it like you usually spend any other budget, right? How do you spend your error budget? In the case of the service that we're building, we have a 20% error budget. Usually, or co companies, you spend that money, or sorry, spend that budget by launching, by enabling, increasing the release cadence, increasing the feature velocity, increasing experimentation, until things remain within the budget, right? Again, we are introducing change until we get to a point where the reliability of our service is at risk, as defined not by SRE, as defined by SRE, dev, and product, right? So. When companies exceed the error budget, what do they usually do? Okay, they usually, anyway, you, companies need a plan. But they usually take actions to improve reliability, to bring the system back to a level of reliability that is acceptable by our customers, right? So things, examples uh, for actions that companies take when they, when they exceed the error budget. So they could stop launching new features. They could change the engineering priorities to focus on reliability of the existing elements. They could implement hybrid on-call rotation. So the SRE team has more manpower to deal with the short-term reliability issues to bring uh, the service to the level of reliability that they want to, okay? Essentially, SRE uses error budgets and service level objectives as a contract, as a way to balance reliability of the service with feature velocity, with innovation, okay? That's a central point for SRE, for us to understand. It's a central connection point with the DevOps uh, practices as well, okay? Let's jump into the LinkedIn story. Um, I'd like to introduce you Ben Ferguson. Ben is not here, um, but I'd like to introduce him. Ben is a director in the uh, LinkedIn SRE team, okay? And I call him the chief storyteller, okay? That's not his title, but in addition to helping SRE, helping LinkedIn build their SRE practice. Ben and most of his team also did a great job documenting that journey, okay? So if you wanna learn more about what happened inside LinkedIn, some of the specific situations, the incidents, the problems, um, the decisions that they made, some of the lessons learned, the double click for the conversation that we're gonna have today about their journey, you can go, uh, actually you can go to my Twitter feed, my pinned tweet, has a link to this series, or you can just search every day's Monday in operations as well, and you're gonna find it's a series of blog posts created by Ben and by the rest of the LinkedIn team, okay? Very, very useful, it's a timeless piece of information, full of lessons for devs and, team, uh, dev and ops teams alike. Uh, that's why I, I pinned in my, my you know, Twitter feed. Uh, I can get tired of reading some of those articles. Uh, really, it's a great example of what most organizations go through, right? Uh, again, full of lessons for us, okay? The story starts in 2010. Uh, at the time, LinkedIn was going through a very rapid growth, essentially hyper growth, very similar to Google, right? The, the user base was growing more than 50% year over year, and they had a lot of problems keeping their site up. 
Um, the customer experience was not at the desired level. The management knew it. Everyone knew it. Full of the site was full of reliability issues, right? The, t the way the, team was w the teams were operating was very much like a traditional um, dynamic, right? With dev owning the application, owning the code. When the code was ready, they would throw over the wall. Um, they didn't have access to production. They didn't have access to staging or, or even to uh, co basic configuration. The ops teams, and there were many ops teams, fragmented ops teams, one of them was responsible for getting the code, deploying into the production environment, and trying to keep the site up without a lot of knowledge about the architecture, especially let alone the code, right? So it was a very challenging environment, but also very common, right, when you think about the traditional uh, IT operating model. The release, the release process at the time was also very, uh, uh, characterized as a very traditional. The releases were big, significant. They happened every other week. Uh, they happened after hours. Uh, and essentially took many hours to complete, and the next morning was a really challenging morning for most of the people involved in those releases, right? So anyway, it wasn't a really good place to be. If you are in a phase of hypergrowth with competitive pressure, and your team is starting to see the need to increase the pace of innovation that you need to deliver to your customers, and you face these problems, you need to react, you need to do something about. Right? And basically, the leadership team decided to aggregate all the operations teams under one team and implement SRE, implement site reliability engineering. Okay? The dev teams were going, starting to go through their agile and DevOps journey. Right? And this was the perfect uh, decision to make because it just gave the ops team the material, that they, the, kind of the, 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 the IP, the content that they needed to go and basically support the key goals, the strategic goals that the dev team was trying to accomplish as well. A really important thing that they did at this time, they set the principles for the SRE organization. Okay? These are the three principles, and they kept coming back to these principles. You're gonna see through their journey, right, um, that challenging decisions uh, and you know, things were not easy all the time, or actually they were hard most of the time. They need to keep coming back to the principles to, to guide their uh, SRE adoption, their SRE implementation. The first principle is, refers to site up. And it's essentially a recognition that for a company like LinkedIn, right, having the site up, have the application, serve the application to the user is paramount, is everything, right? Software has no value if the systems are down, right? Coming over uh, a number of years where reliability was a big challenge, there is a sense of compl complacency that was starting to grow into the ops organization. And the site up culture was instituted to fight back, to basically fight back the notion that an outage is a normal thing. It's not. Okay? For a company like LinkedIn, if you have an online service, right, serving that service, that app to your users is everything. Okay? The second principle has actually two angles, and power developer ownership has two angles. The first one, very connected to site up culture, right? It's everyone's job, everyone's responsibility inside the company to serve that application to the users, right? It's also developers' responsibility to do that. So developers are as accountable as the SRE team to make sure that the application is reliable and the site stays up, okay? That is also a cultural element. And as we know, cultural elements or cultural changes, they take time, and they require persistence, so it's great to have a principle around that. The second angle for the empowered developer ownership was a commitment from the SRE team to support the agile DevOps journey that the dev teams were starting to go through, right? Okay, you're gonna launch faster, you're gonna increase release cadence, you're gonna increase feature velocity, you're gonna increase experimentation, Okay, I'm going to support you. I'm going to be there to enable you. So we're going to have to make some changes in, our, in the way we work together and in our release process to make sure that we support that. Because that's the best for our users, that's the best for our company. Okay? And the third principle is essentially transforming operations from a traditional operations perspective or approach into an engineering discipline. Right? Finding permanent solutions, software solutions, for the problems that they were facing in their infrastructure and automating as much as possible that infrastructure, treat that infrastructure as code, right, in the same way they treat their applications. Those are the three principles established by the LinkedIn 
uh, leadership in the LinkedIn uh, dev and SRE organizations. Okay? This is their journey. We're going to go quickly over each one of these stages. But I, I, I like this slide because it, it shows us that, again, it's a journey. <laughs> It's a multi-year effort, right? It started in 2010, 2011, we are in 2018, and they consider that they are get, now getting to that last stage that they call the engineer, right? So it doesn't happen overnight, it doesn't come from a box that you buy somewhere, right? It, it, it takes a lot of hard work to get this done, okay? So let's go real quick through these stages, right? The first one they call the generations, and that's literally how they define their own journey. These slides were built by Ben, and I'm very proud to present exactly the slides that he built because that story comes from that team directly. So the first generation, the firefighter, is essentially defined by, by chaos, right? Um, think about the teams coming together, the different ops teams, and you know, there's you know, the desire to build a necessary organization, new roles and responsibilities, but in reality, behaviors remain the same. And again, that's very normal when you are implementing a change like this, right? Um, it was a very difficult time. They kept going with the reliability issues. Uh, and, and, you know, it, again, very difficult time. They had things like the 6 a.m. shifts. Uh, 6 a.m. shifts, um, they became, of course, infamous. Uh, and, and they lasted for more than a year, uh, for a couple of years during this time. Um, all engineers on call had to be on site at 6 a.m. during the week because they knew the site would go down anywhere between, anytime between 7 a.m. and 10 a.m. Everyone need to be there on site, laptops fired up, ready to go. Okay, almost every day this would happen. It had to do with the traffic pa pattern at the time. When West Coast traffic was hitting the site, the site would essentially catch fire. Uh, and, uh, and, and, you know, and they had to be there to support that. Okay, it wasn't fun, it wasn't fun at all. During this time, the MTTR, for an outage was around 1,500 minutes. If you do the math, that's more than a day. That's more than 24 hours, okay? It's a pretty long time. And the number of outages was so significant, so big, that if they lined up all the outages perfectly, one next to the other, the site would go down, or not go down, but they would have an outage every second of every day of every month for an entire year. Okay, again, not an easy environment, not an easy scenario to be in, right? How did the team turn that around? How did they actually, you know, move from that scenario to something better? Okay, there were three investment areas that they made during this time. And remember, this was a multi-year phase in this generation, right? That's where things essentially make or break. If you're going to transform your operations, your IT operations organization, if you're gonna really build an SRE organization, right? The first investment area was the site up. Side up as a culture internally, side up as a culture that needs to be develop, developed across the company, right? But doing the double click, what are the practices that we need to adopt, right? To actually make sure people understand what we mean by side up, right? That was the time that they became really, really focused on very disciplined around um, the, um, the incident reviews, right? The blameless post-mortems, right? That was, that was one example, right? That was the time where they started bringing engineers with a development background, right? The second investment area was around data. Um, they made significant improvements, to the, significant improvements to their data infrastructure, and they exposed that data to the dev teams in a self-service way, okay? That for the first time, they enabled the dev teams to see what was going on with their applications right, in real time, uh, and to see what's going on across the software life cycle, all right? That was a very important decision that they made. We'll see later why. They also invested in automation. Anything that they could automate, initially their scripts, initially their checklists. So instead of running a, a script or following a checklist for one hour, if you can automate that and use that one hour to do engineering work, you're gonna be in a better place, okay? Those decisions paid off. They went to the second stage they called the gatekeeper. This stage is here just for completeness, okay? This is an evolutionary dead end. It's not a good place to be. You don't want to be here. Unfortunately, a lot of traditional organizations that operate in a traditional IT environment ended up here. This is where the IT operations team in general, when they are able to stabilize the site and find some time, they actually use the time to build walls around the site, 
right, to prevent change from happen. If change brings or affects reliability, right, so let's create a wall around the site, and it's usually a human wall, right, um, and, and you know, that that's really doesn't help, doesn't help the organization to move forward in the cultural change, okay? LinkedIn accidentally avoid this stage for two reasons, okay? We have, we have something in the back? Okay, all right. LinkedIn accidentally, it's just, it's just a reminder for me to finish now. <laughs> um, and we're gonna finish very quickly. Uh, so LinkedIn avoided this stage, they were outnumbered, okay? Uh, so they had to make a decision, and the decision was instead of building a human gatekeeping or a human wall around the site, was to build tools. This was the time where LinkedIn, the SRE team became, resp became responsible for the soft, not only the infrastructure, um, automation, but also for the software lifecycle automation, okay? And this allowed the team to build partnerships with certain dev teams that were ready to essentially to share the, that accountability, right? The SRE LinkedIn team became responsible for the entire so software lifecycle for some of these teams, their entire CI CD pipeline, right? Which took them to this, to the advocate stage, which is the third generation, right? That was really when the teams who actually had partnership with the LinkedIn SRE team, when the dev, those dev teams essentially realize that by sharing that accountability, by having those teams working together, they could deliver more reliable they could de products, they could deliver a better uh, experience, okay? So the quick wins became visible across the company. Other dev teams wanted to have the same relationship. That was a time again where the SRE LinkedIn team grew significantly and invested heavily in building more tools. As you can see, the SRE organization is very different than a traditional IT operations organization. They got to a stage where they called the partner where most dev teams in the organization were now working together with the SRE team. And the teams that were not, they were very vocal, complaining because they wanted to have the same benefits that the other teams were having, okay? Here's where the roles and responsibilities between dev and SRE become so similar and they know so much about each other that LinkedIn started implementing things like the hybrid on-call rotation. Really doesn't matter if the person who picks up the phone is from the SRE team or is the person is from the dev team. They know each other really well, they know their functions really well, they know what they do really well, they know their code really well, that if someone needs to call someone else for help, it's not because they don't know what's going on on the infrastructure or what's going on on the code is because maybe they need to uh, parallelize, they need help to try to tackle two, three, four different things at the same time, okay? This is the first time the word proactive actually shows up in this story. This is where the planning is done together and reliability is built, built in essentially in the entire software lifecycle. The last stage, the engineer, is essentially where they are getting to that stage right now. And again, the roles and responsibilities converge, strong relationships across the company. This become the default way of developing software and developing services and products at LinkedIn, okay? They, they are getting to that stage right now. And if you ask someone, what is your job, right? The answer, the ideal answer at this stage is we are engineers, we're all engineers, right? The engineers of different stripes, maybe we do certain things differently, but we're all engineers, okay? And we're all here to help our customers and our company win. And I'm gonna wrap up the case study essentially uh, showing some data validation from LinkedIn users, right? Essentially showing that they are accomplished just that, right? Across some very meaningful categories, LinkedIn has been ranked in the digital trust rankings very high, essentially first place in the last two years, showing that the decisions that they made um, and the areas that they decided to focus on are really paying off for the company, okay? So get it started, educate yourself, participate in the community, look inside your company, find compelling reasons like the same as the LinkedIn had, for example, if you have you know, difficulty keeping the site up, if you need to innovate faster, if you need to experiment more, it's great reasons, right? You can learn and experiment internally, test your SLOs, build your infrastructure, your monitoring infrastructure, your alert infrastructure, do incident reviews, review with your peers. And when you get to a point where you know more about SRE and you know more about what's going on in your environment, talk to your leadership. Try to align those things because SRE doesn't happen without leadership or, or without executive sponsorship as well. 
If you want to know how Microsoft does SRE or if you want to learn more, uh, you can visit our docs. Uh, and you can also DM me on Twitter. Uh, I can give you a pass if you want to test Azure or in, you see how Azure can help with the uh, building or uh, monitoring infrastructure. This pass does not require a credit card. By the way, it doesn't have to be for SRE only. If you want to do anything with Azure, just DM me. I'll give you the pass. Okay. Thank you very much. Apologies for going a few minutes over. Time. So uh, we'll just take one question. Uh, Venkat Adanki has been very active on the Pigeon Hall, which makes me wonder if anyone else actually know how to set up and how to access it. <laughs> so uh, is SRE equal DevOps plus best monitoring and logging for AI for root, root cause analysis? SRE uh, is, uh, I'm going to borrow words from the Google book, SRE is an opinionated implementation of DevOps. The principles are very much the same. SRE and DevOps try to accomplish the same things. SRE is a more particular, more specific implementation of DevOps in the, uh, in the operations space. Okay, that was a quick answer. So then uh, we can take the second question, which is how do you relate the DevOps product feature teams with SRE? Who is responsible with the CD, automation, and the accountability of the product? Feature through its life cycle. And there's one more comment. Um, how do you ensure it's not adding silos to DevOps approach? Absolutely. Um, again, in terms of principles, very, very aligned. Okay. In terms of how to implement those principles, every company is different. In the case of SRE, and in the case of you know the way Google implemented and the way they recommend in the kind of SRE literature, is you place SRE resources with the dev resources that are on point for a certain product. So essentially, you create that product unit that uh, Ken mentioned before. Again, that's why I mentioned it's very well aligned. Uh, you don't you, you you don't just create a team, call them SRE, and think magic's going to happen. It's the way they work together, is the way they share metrics, is the way they communicate. It's essential for the success, right? Uh, thank you, Marcelo. Thank you.